all, welcome back to General Pharmacology. Let's move to the PowerPoint slides and get started. Let's see if we can get through today on time. When we originally created this curriculum, uh, 5.1 was antimicrobial agents, and then um, the cancer chemotherapeutic agents are more fun to talk about. So that became 5.1. Uh, actually, we switched that to give students more time in the clinical discussion section. Uh, but now that all that clinical discussion section has changed, uh, we're probably going to go back and make this one 5.1. Maybe we'll talk about antimicrobial agents. I like to talk about the antimicrobial agents and cancer chemotherapy. I like to get through those first lectures first uh, before the final starts. And then while the final is ongoing, uh, we can talk about all sorts of antimicrobial agents and all sorts of uh, cancer chemotherapeutic agents. Something I'm going to do is in your folder, I'm going to have uh, information that's designed for advanced, uh, advanced people in this business uh, covering hospital-acquired infections, uh, cause, uh, hospital healthcare-acquired healthcare, um, infection, including nosocomial infections, uh, I have a great read on uh, resistant microorganisms. I just got through reading something great on tuberculosis. So uh, your notes, this lecture right here might end in influenza. Today, uh, we're going to swap out influenza for tuberculosis. And so I'm going to apologize in advance that Section 5 uh, keeps getting reshuffled, but we reshuffle it every few years. Anyway, uh, but antimicrobial agents uh, always begins with this right here, and so your notes will be fine until until we get to tuberculosis, which I think is uh, in your uh, uh, section two for uh, the second lecture in antimicrobial agents. All right. Well, one of the problems with the antimicrobial agents, they have all sorts of different names. Antibiotics are typically used for bacteria, antifungals for funguses, antiprotozoal agents or protozoan agents for protozoa, antihelminthic agents, those treat worms. So there's all sorts of different words to use the antimicrobial agents. If an infection is localized, that means it's limited to one area. If an infection is systemic, uh, that infection involves the entire body. So I also have a great read on sepsis. And I'll put those folders in your resources section so you guys can get really in depth in this information uh, because I don't go into a lot of depth in any of this information. There are all sorts of disease processes caused by infection. It's just like cancer. We think, oh, cancer is one word, but it describes all sorts of different disease processes. Infection, uh, even broader. There are many, many causes of infection and all sorts of terms to describe those infections. Uh, but from microbiology, if you've taken a microbiology class, uh, then you'll know that there are gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. And so that's generally how we describe infectious organisms that are bacteria, whether they're gram positive and they just have this nice purple stain on the gram stain. Uh, gram negative means they don't take up the gram stain, they pick up a red stain on the gram stain. And so uh, you might hear of gram positive uh, cocci, that's what we see here. Coccus is plural. Cocci is, I'm sorry, coccus is singular. Cocci is plural. And this comes from grapes. And so these look like little grapes under the microscope. And that's where those words come from. So we're looking at gram positive cocci under the electron microscope right here. And they, they've been artificially colored to look this way. That's not a gram stain. Uh, this is a single bacteria referred to as a diplococcus or a diplococci. Um, strep pneumonia is a diplococcus, and it has this double spherical shape. However, that's not two organisms getting ready to undergo mitosis. That is a single bacteria that is a diplococcus. And uh, gram-negative uh, organisms will stain red under the microscope. Uh, Gram-negative rods, that's what's most common. Gram-positive cocci, gram-negative rods are most common. Uh, however, there are uh, gram-positive rods and, and gram-negative cocci as well we will come across. Uh, but the rods are called bacillus, uh, the plural bacilli, and these are rod-shaped bacteria. 
Uh, we'll describe um, bacteria as aerobic, and that means they have to have oxygen. <clears throat> anaerobic anaerobic uh, means they don't need oxygen. Oxygen is actually toxic to an anaerobic bacteria. However, a lot of things that you'll read about are facultative anaerobes, <clears throat> and that means uh, they can be both aeric aerobic and anaerobic. And so this is important because anaerobic, these are the type of bacteria that we'll find deep in a penetrating wound. Uh, maybe a penetrating wound in the gut, or maybe a penetrating wound deep inside the fascia of the leg, where they can be in an anaerobic part of the body and grow. Uh, however, most of the stuff we see is facultative anaerobe. Uh, that means if it's on the surface, it can't possibly be an exclusive anaerobe because it's exposed to oxygen. And so where the infection is tells us whether we need to be thinking about exclusive anaerobes uh, or faculta facultative anaerobes, which are essentially both aerobic and anaerobic bacteria. Uh, many of the infections and Bacteria that cause those infections will be extracellular bacteria. That means they can live outside of the host. When we talk about tuberculosis, uh, we'll talk about an intracellular organism. The tuberculosis can live with inside of uh, a macrophage for a very long time. And so uh, we'll talk about intracellular and extracellular bacteria, uh, where some bacteria will live inside of the host cell. That'll make it more difficult to treat when they are intracellular bacteria. Uh, your slides say bacteriostatic. Anytime you see that static word, that means it pre prevents bacteria reproduction. I was just reading something the other day. They referred to it as microbiostatic, meaning not just necessarily antibacterial agents, but any kind of microbe, antimicrobial agent uh, that prevents bacterial reproduction without killing the bacteria. Uh, then we call that static. So bacteriostatic, microbiostatic, our words we'll toss around uh, that mean preventing bacterial reproduction. Lytic or cytal means causing bacteria death. Bacterial lytic causes bacteria death. Microbiocidal means it causes the death of the microbe. And so when I first heard this, I'm like, well, gee, well, this has to be better than that. I mean, this only prevents bacterial reproduction, but, but this kills the bacteria. Hey, this is what we want to use, and that's not always going to be the correct answer. So one of the problems that we'll see with lytic or cytal agents, microbiocidal agents or bacteriolytic agents, is that when we cause cell death, when we cause bacterial death, uh, those bacterial parts are broken, are broken up and released into the body. Those endotoxins will be released uh, very quickly, and that can cause more harm than good. So sometimes we'll be in situations where we don't want a lytic or a cytal uh, antimicrobial agent. We won't want a microbiocidal agent. Uh, we will want a static agent. Uh, because these are going to prevent bacterial reproduction and stop long enough for the immune system to come in and take over and consume those bacteria and those endotoxins within the white blood cells. And so many situations you'll see a static bac uh, a bacteriostatic or a microbiostatic agent preferred over a lytic agent because well, we don't want all those bacterial parts just being released into the bloodstream all at the same time. Uh, so be on the lookout uh, for uh, antibiotics that are bacteriolytic versus bacteriostatic. Well, it's only been recently that we realized that infections were caused by other living organisms residing in the host. Now, for thousands of years, empirically, we've treated people with infections uh, in isolation, and we've engaged in all sorts of behaviors to prevent the spread of illness. However, it's only recently that we realized that these infections were caused by microorganisms living inside of the host. And there have been cultures using plants and minerals to treat infectious diseases for throughout history. 
uh, but our understanding of infectious disease and the scientific use of antimicrobial agents is, is less than a century old. So only in the last hundred years have we really understood uh, what antibiotics uh, were doing. Uh, many horrible diseases are no longer killing the masses worldwide while new, uh, new organisms emerge. And so one of the assignments in your clinical discussion section is learn about the history of infectious disease and human suffering that this has caused. The Black Plague, we don't really see that anymore. It hasn't killed. Uh, the Black Plague uh, killed uh, a quarter, a third of the population of Europe, I believe, more. Uh, killed millions of people during uh, the 1600s, I believe. And it's, it's, it's incredible the amount of death and, and, and suffering that these uh, agents, have, these, these uh, bacteria have caused. And so we live in this age of antibiotics where we don't see these horrible scourges anymore. But before uh, we start talking about antimicrobial agents, antibiotics, uh, clearing the world of some of these horrible things, I can assure you that hand washing, clean water, or proper sewage have done more to combat infectious disease than anything else, not even anything close to this. We know when there's a flood and it uh, causes problems with our sewage plant, our wastewater plant, uh, we know that there is an increase in infectious disease in and around uh, that treatment plant. And so we know that sewage treatment, proper sanitation, and clean water are essential to combating infectious disease. And so when you look at neglected infectious diseases in developing nations in Africa and elsewhere, keep in mind uh, that maybe what they need is this clean water and proper sanitation. That'll do more to combat those diseases than anything else. Uh, but this is a pharmacology class, and so uh, throughout the ages, uh, some have known that uh, sulfur compounds uh, placed on wounds uh, would prevent what we now call infection. And through scientific study, uh, we came up with the first antibiotic, a sulfonamide. So the sulfonamides were the first antimicrobial drugs, and they paved the way for the modern antibiotic revolution uh, that we see today. The first sulfonamide was con pron called prontosil, and it was a pro-drug. And these experiments began in 1932, uh, the Bayer Laboratories. Now, prontosil was the first medicine ever discovered that could effectively treat a wide range of bacterial infections. Uh, but something that was interesting is that it had no effect uh, in vitro in the uh, test tube. It only worked inside of live creatures, live mammals, in vivo. And it took them a while to figure out, wait a minute, this is a pro-drug. Uh, if you put the drug on the actual infection itself, it's not going to work. It's not going to work until it undergoes the first pass effect. And once this drug, prontosal, undergoes the first pass effect, then it becomes an active antibi anti uh, antibiotic. Uh, the sulfonamides uh, prevent a key step in folate synthesis, and folate is necessary for cells to synthesize the nucleic acid. Uh, so, um, the, by preventing folic acid, we prevent cells from dividing. Folate is not synthesized in mammals. It's a dietary requirement. We have to get folate from our, from our diet. Uh, and so this is why the sulfonamides are sp specifically toxic to bacteria, because the bacteria can synthesize their folate and so by using sulfonamides, we can interfere with the bacteria's ability to make folate, which then interferes with its ability uh, to make nucleotides. The sulfonamides are bacteriostatic because they prevent uh, reproduction of the bacteria. Uh, the sulfonamides are, can be used for all sorts of reasons. Uh, one of the most common reasons is bacterial conjunctivitis. Uh, silvadine cream, silver sulfadiazine cream, is commonly used uh, for burns, but it can be used for other, uh, for other 
uh, skin infections as well. Uh, Bactrim, Septra, which is uh, sulfamethoxazole, and trimethoprim, uh, these can be in co used. These are used in combination. It's a very potent antibiotic. It's commonly used for urinary tract infections. Uh, trimethoprim is also a folate synthesis inhibitor, and so by giving them in combination, uh, this is a commonly used bacteria uh, antibiotic, uh, commonly used in urinary tract infections. All right, well, the sulfonamides are not only antibiotics, uh, but the sulfonylureas, thiazide diuretics, even Lasix, those are sulfonamides as well. And so those are the sulfa-based drugs. And so when somebody says, oh, well, they're allergic to sulfa-based drugs, uh, sulfa antibiotics, we have to keep in mind that thiazides and the sulfonylureas, which have traditionally been used as oral agents uh, for diabetes mellitus type 2, uh, that these are sulfa drugs and can cause allergic reaction. Uh, for those of you keeping score, there is the sulfonamide group right there. Unfortunately, the sulfonamide groups, uh, the sulfonamides in general cause allergic reaction in about 5% of the population, and the sulfonamides are the leading cause of drug induced Steven Johnson syndrome. Uh, Stevens Johnson syndrome is, is uh, for lack of a better term, like a very severe allergic reaction, although uh, the mechanisms aren't the same, uh, but we can see a severe, uh, severe damage to the skin and blistering. Uh, these are all people with Steven Johnson syndrome uh, vesication. And so I want you guys to take a look at Stevens Johnson syndrome and realize that all sorts of problems can cause Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Cancer can cause Stevens-Johnson syndrome, uh, but drugs can cause Stevens-Johnson syndrome as well, and sulfonamides are the leading cause of drug-induced Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Now, pretty much anything can cause Stevens-Johnson syndrome. It's just very rare uh, in certain situations. Uh, however, the sulfonamides are most common. All right, the polyketides are metabolites from bacteria, funguses, plants, and animals. Specifically, I want to talk about the polyketides from bacteria. When we talked about the cancer chemotherapeutic agents, we talked about plants and bacteria that secreted uh, these little toxins to prevent other creatures from consuming them or encroaching on them. And so uh, you'll hear about probiotics. These are uh, beneficial bacteria. And what do these beneficial bacteria do? Well, they secrete their own form of antibiotics to prevent uh, other bacteria from uh, growing too rapidly and encroaching on their space. And so bacteria and funguses, they secrete little poisons uh, to prevent <coughs> other bacteria from getting too close to them. Uh, something else they can do is they can share uh, these recipes uh, with other bacteria in the form of plasmids. And so drug resistance through plasmids, uh, that's very interesting to read about, uh, I think, and I'll put a folder about drug resistance uh, in your antimicrobial section if you want very long, complicated things about polyketides. Uh, something else about the polyketides is this is where the word mycin comes from, and so uh, something I want you to keep in mind is bleomycin and vancomycin aren't necessarily related to erythromycin. All this time, if a word, uh, if generic words had the same ending, then they were in the same drug class. And that's very helpful now, but that does not work with the antibiotic. The mycins are quite simply polyketides. M-Y-C-I-N, everything that ends in M-Y-C-I-N in the antibiotic business is related to a polyketide. It comes from a naturally occurring substance produced by a bacteria, uh, a fungus like the cephalosporins. They come from a fungus. So I want you to keep that in mind as we talk about all the different uh, antibiotics that came from bacteria and funguses. All right, uh, we've always known that certain plants, certain molds uh, were helpful in preventing what we now call infection. Uh, but we started studying this uh, scientifically in 1875. Uh, let's see if that's on here. No, it's not. All right. Um, it's long been known that certain ancient, you know what, I'm going to go look for the slide. I don't, let's see if I can find the slides I'm looking for. Because if 
These are not the slides I want. I guess we'll have to come back to them. Nope, not those. All right, darn it. Well, that being said, all right, so we knew uh, that certain molds made penicillins, and we were well aware of their antimicrobial properties. However, uh, mass production of penicillin uh, didn't occur until 1940. And so something you'll read about if you go back and look is that the original penicillins uh, were not metabolized by the liver. They were completely excreted through the urine. And so penicillin was so rare that we were able to collect it. Uh, we would collect it from the urine of patients who were receiving the penicillin and we'd isolate out the penicillin and then reuse that up until the mass production of penicillin. And so once we have an effective uh, antibiotic, uh, then we start having drug company ads. And so uh, penicillin doesn't treat gonorrhea today, but when penicillin was first used in mass production, it easily treated uh, all sorts of infections. However, uh, it didn't take long for Staph aureus to become resistant to penicillin. That started in the 1950s. And some bacteria, which had never even been pathogens before penicillin, emerged as pathogens because of penicillin. And so today, when we think about the overuse of antibiotics, we're always thinking of doctors and in a clinical setting uh, due to our uh, abundant use of antibiotics in those situations. However, if we read carefully, we know that agriculture, uh, aquaculture, uh, animal reproduction, and all those antibacterial products that we can buy over the counter and pour down the drain, uh, these are all contributing to resistant organisms. Uh, organisms not only resistant to penicillin, but pretty much every antibiotic we can come up with, uh, we're coming up with an organism, uh, some type of bacteria that's resistant to it. And so this is what we're seeing now in modern uh, medicine is how can we use these antibiotics judiciously, carefully, so that we're not causing uh, resistant organisms to emerge. All right, so back to our regularly scheduled program. I want you to know that the penicillins, which come from mold, the cephalosporins, cephalohead sporins, as in fungus, uh, these mushrooms made the cephalosporins, and then the carbapenems, are all beta-lactam antibiotics. And that's because of that beta-lactam ring right there. And so penicillin has a beta-lactam ring in it. That's where that beta-lactam comes from. Uh, the the beta-lactam antibiotics are lytic. Uh, even though they prevent the synthesis of the bacterial cell wall, the bacterial cell wall is breaking itself down and reproducing itself all the time. And if you prevent the breakdown, I'm sorry, if you prevent the reproduction of the cell wall, it will sit and break itself down. And so that's what autolysis is, uh, self-destruction. And so by preventing the synthesis of the cell wall, uh, we cause that self-destruction. And so that's why beta-lactam antibiotics are lytic or bacteriolytic microbiocidal. And this is confusing for people, uh, but keep that in mind right there. Uh, this results in their self-destruction, and so these are lytic. The beta-lactam an beta antibiotics uh, are bactericidal, bacteriolytic. All right, beta-lactamase is not an antibiotic. Beta-lactamase is an enzyme made by many bacteria that's going to break down the penicillin. Now again, the penicillin is made by a mold as a polyketide. And so this bacteria over here is going to fight uh, off that penicillin assault from the mold by releasing an enzyme called beta-lactamase to destroy the penicillin. And so 
many bacteria will release beta, uh, resist beta-lactam antibiotics by producing a substance that destroys penicillin, and that's beta-lactamase. And so the basic penicillins will be broken down by beta-lactamase. That's why we develop penicillins that are resistant to beta-lactamase. And so this causes a lot of confusion. Uh, so many beta-lactam antibiotics have varying degrees of beta-lactamase resistance. So the beta-lactam rings are on the antibiotic. Beta-lactamase is an enzyme made by bacteria to destroy penicillin. And so we have to destroy, we have to make antibiotics that are beta-lactamase resistant. Uh, so they can kill the bacteria. Uh, so amoxicillin, amoxicillin uh, uh, amoxyl is a penicillin, it's a beta-lactam antibiotic, but we'll give it in combination with something called clavulonate. Uh, clavulonate, which is clavulonic acid, uh, is a beta-lactamase inhibitor. Clavulonic acid does not have antimicrobial properties. What it does is it prevents the beta-lactam antibiotic uh, from the beta-lactamase being produced and so the beta the clavulonic acid interferes with beta lactamase so beta lactamase cannot destroy the penicillin uh, amoxyl is sensitive to beta lactamase beta lactamase will destroy the amoxicillin and uh, clavulonic acid prevents that from happening and so one of the antibiotics that we'll use uh, to improve the efficacy of the amoxicillin is augmentin, and it's a combination of amoxicillin and a clavulonic, a beta-lactamase inhibitor. And so the point is uh, to show you here we're giving the penicillin in combination with a beta-lactamase inhibitor to improve uh, the uh, efficacy of the amoxicillin. Uh, but we can give this in an IV form as well. Here's ampicillin. It's a, uh, a beta-lactamase sensitive uh, penicillin. And so we'll give sulbactam as a beta-lactamase inhibitor. Again, the ampicillin is the bacteriolytic interfering with the cell wall synthesis, causing aut autolysis, self-destruction. And the, cell, the sulbactam is used to prevent the bacteria from producing from, uh, using its beta-lactamase to destroy the ampicillin. And so that's what when we use unison, and we see that commonly used in the hospital, uh, it's the combination of ampicillin and sulbactam. Uh, sulbactam isn't an antibiotic at all. Uh, sulbactam, sulbactam is a beta-lactamase inhibitor. It inhibits the enzyme that destroys penicillin. Uh, zosin is a uh, piperacillin and tazobactam. Uh, piperacillin is a penicillin. It's, a, it's more beta-lactamase resistant, uh, but we will add tazobactam uh, to the piperacillin as a beta-lactamase inhibitor. Again, tazobactam isn't an antibiotic. Tazobactam interferes with that beta-lactamase uh, that's trying to destroy the penicillin. And so uh, I wanted you to be aware of that. Uh, penicillins are cross-sensitizing and cross-reacting. That means if you're al actually allergic to one penicillin, you're allergic to all of the other penicillins. And uh, however, uh, many people are going to be claim are going to claim to be allergic to pen penicillin, uh, but only a few of them actually are. So you have to ask specifically what their specific reaction was. Uh, I know people who had mononucleosis, like I did, and get a prescription of penicillin. It causes this fine rash. Uh, on their skin, and then we say, oh, we're allergic to penicillin, but we probably really aren't. Uh, and so you have to ask specifically what the reaction is. Now, I've been able to get through my entire life without needing penicillin. Uh, that may change in the future, and so there is a way to give penicillin to people who are allergic to it, and I think uh, we'll cover that uh, when we get to syphilis. All right, the cephalosporins are beta-lactam antibiotics as well. I want you to know them in three generations, first generation, second generation, and the third generation. And after that, there's a fourth generation. I think they give up counting after that, and they just call them extended generation cephalosporins. Uh, 
Uh, I'm not convinced that fourth needs its own category. To begin with, I thought first, second, and third generation work just fine. So let's talk about those. Uh, one of the first generation cephalosporins is cephalexin, which is keflex. Traditionally, they're very uh, active against gram-positive bacteria. Of course, uh, uh, resistance continues to emerge every day. Something that I do want you to get from the slide is there is a 10% cross-reactivity with penicillin allergy. So if somebody's truly allergic to penicillin, there is a 10% chance that they're allergic to a first-generation cephalosporin. And so it's going to be important to ask, and I routinely ask this when I'm giving someone a first-generation cephalosporin. I'll say, are you allergic to penicillin? And if they say yes, I'm like, well, have you ever had Keflex before? Oh, yeah, I've had Keflex before. It works fine. I don't have an I don't have a allergic reaction to it. And so you might find yourself getting a call from the pharmacist who knows that there is a 10% cross-reactivity with penicillin allergy, meaning it's a 10% chance that if they're truly allergic to a penicillin, they will be allergic to a first-generation cephalosporin. So we need to be on the lookout for that. Uh, Keflex orally uh, is cephalexin. Cefazolin is ANCEF IV. These are first-generation cephalosporins that are commonly used. The second generation cephalosporins had more gram-negative coverage, meaning they were able to treat more gram-negative uh, organisms than the first generation. So as we go through the generations of cephalosporins, what we're going to see is extended coverage of gram-negative organisms, but also what we're seeing is what's called broader spectrum. So as we go through the uh, cephalosporins into the third generation, we're seeing this broader spectrum of what the antibiotic can treat. And so we get slightly more uh, coverage, we get a more coverage of gram-negative organisms. Uh, we see these mainly used in sinusitis, otitis, respiratory tract infection, although I'm hard pressed to think of any kind of infection where second generation cephalosporin is the drug of choice. Uh, certainly uh, next in line, and again the cephalosporins are beta-lactam antibiotics uh, that came from mushrooms. Uh, C-chlor, Cefzil, Cefetan, which is IV, Cefachlor, C-chlor, Cefprozil, Cefzil, Cefetitan, Cefetan. Uh, these are second generation cephalosporins. Third generation cephalosporins will have more gram negative coverage than the previous generations and still really good uh, first, I'm sorry, really good uh, gram-positive coverage. Uh, the most common third-generation cephalosporin we use is rocephin. Uh, it's been very effective at treating all sorts of infections as a broad-spectrum antibiotic. Ceftriaxone is rocephin. Uh, clafuran is cefataxime. It's available IV. And then cefixime uh, used to be called Suprax. It's an oral third-generation cephalosporin. It came off the market because it wasn't really popular for its intended purpose. However, uh, we realized that this was a very effective treatment for gonorrhea, which has become more and more uh, resistant uh, to the different uh, antibiotics. And so now um, the use of third generation cephalosporins in the treatment of gonorrhea is essential. So they brought back cefixime orally specifically for the treatment of uh, gonorrhea because it requires a third generation cephalosporin. Uh, the fourth generation cephalosporins and the extended uh, cephalosporins, uh, ceph uh, cefepime, which is maxepime, uh, it's like a third generation cephalosporin, but it's going to be more resistant to beta-lactamase. And something that makes it a fourth generation cephalosporin, it's going to have more activities against something called Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, let me fix that. I don't know why my spell checker's on today as opposed to the last however many years. Uh, the carbapenems are um, broad spectrum antibiotics that are beta lactam uh, as well. Uh, imipenem, which is primaxim, miropenem, which is mirum, these are broad spectrum. Uh, uh, antibiotics, uh, beta-lactam antibiotics that are used for organisms that are resistant to the other antibiotics. 
Uh, however, there is a possibility there can be uh, cross sensitivity with the penicillins. And so keep this in mind when we're using uh, Primaxim and Mirum, that there is a possibility if somebody's really allergic to penicillin, they can be allergic to these as well. And all of them are bacteriolytic. All right, vancomycin does not have a beta-lactam ring, and so we don't consider it to be a beta-lactam antibiotic. However, its mechanism of action is very similar to the other beta-lactam antibiotics, so that's how vancomycin ended up here. Uh, vancomycin is not related to erythromycin. It is not in the same class. They share that mycin word because they are polyketides derived originally from plants. Uh, bacteria and funguses. Uh, vancomycin remains the drug of choice against methicillin resistant Staph aureus and so methicillin uh, is a type of penicillin uh, that should be very effective against Staph aureus and over time it is uh, Staph aureus has become resistant to it. Uh, however, uh, a lot of times during surgery, we'd want to give vancomycin as prophylaxis against uh, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, and so our, our use of vancomycin has resulted in something called vancomycin-resistant group D enterococcus, and so that's something interesting to read about. And if you want to read a lot about that, uh, I have a great read on resistant microorganisms uh, that I can pass along to you guys. Uh, the tetracyclines, the macrolides, and clindamycin. Clindamycin is, uh, is not related to the other mycins, but it is a bacterial ribosomal inhibitor. Again, that mycin word means it's a polyketide derived from a uh, bacteria or a fungus. Uh, and these are going to be ribosomal inhibitors. Now remember, when we talked about ribosomes, there was a big subunit and a little subunit. And the 30S subunit's the small one, the big uh, the 50S is the bigger one. Uh, most of the time, most of the books I read, they don't distinguish between 30S and 50S subunit inhibitors, but if you read about 30S subunit inhibitors and 50S subunit inhibitors, they're talking about bacterial ribosomal inhibitors, and by interfering with the ribosome, uh, we interfere with protein synthesis. So if you remember from the second lecture, there's my ribosome with the big part and a little part, and in the bacteria, these ribosomal inhibitors interfere with that. <coughs> uh, bacteria exert the resistance to these antibiotics either by pump or mutation of the ribosome. I'll put a big read in your section that'll make uh, this slide far more complicated uh, than that, and I don't ask any questions about this type of resistance. All right, so the tetracyclines are ribosomal inhibitors. They are bacteriostatic, meaning they interfere with the reproduction of the bacteria, and they're used for all sorts of gram-positive and gram-negative uh, bacteria. But over time, many bacteria become resistant to the tetracyclines. Uh, we want to avoid the tetracyclines in children and pregnant women because of this right here. This should be in bright yellow. It interferes with calcium metabolism, and so it can interfere with the development of teeth and bones. Uh, in children uh, when they are gestating within their mother. Uh, it can interfere with liver function. Uh, it can be toxic to the kidneys and can also cause photosensitivity. And that's something that we're sensitive here in Hawaii. The sun uh, can cause the skin to rash more easily, itch more easily. Tetracyclines are a cause of photosensitivity as well as doxycycline. Doxycycline is used for um, all sorts of infections. Uh, we can use it prophylactically for the treatment of uh, anthrax. Um, it's effective uh, against uh, Yersinia pestis, uh, the infectious ag agent of the bubonic plague. Uh, uh, it can also be used in malaria prophylaxis as well. When I did, is that the next slide here? Um, you see the list. There's all sorts of infections we can use doxycycline for, uh, especially, um, uh, what am I looking for? Lyme disease. Uh, be on the lookout for doxycycline in the treatment of Lyme disease. Um, when I did, uh, I did emergency medicine during um, the 9-11 attacks, and back then we were all excited about anthrax. Uh, and on television they were selling ciprofloxacin. They were trying to convince people that ciprofloxacin was the treatment for anthrax. 
and uh, that's not the case at all. Um, Cipro does work against anthrax, however doxycycline works fine against anthrax. That scare was due to the fact that uh, in Russian laboratories they were developing anthrax that was resistant to doxycycline. That's where all that ciprofloxacin business came from, if you remember that. However, uh, I did do a bioterrorism uh, course uh, with uh, representatives from the military and uh, it was very interesting for them to talk about the use of doxycycline in infectious warfare uh, and they had all sorts of interesting uh, things to say about the use of doxycycline because it's a wide range of use for all sorts of interesting infections. Uh, that being said, uh, let's talk about the macrolides. The macrolides are erythromycin, clarithromycin, azithromycin. There's one more on the list that's not commonly used, uh, but these are the three most commonly used macrolides. And again, that mycin word doesn't come from the fact they're macrolides. The mycin word comes from the fact that they're polyketides. <coughs> erythromycin can be used in the treatment of community-acquired pneumonia that is due to pneumococcus. Uh, it has use in mycoplasma and Legionella as well. It can be used as a penicillin substitute in allergic individuals. Uh, more and more we're seeing erythromycin resistant community acquired pneumonia. And that just reminds me of all sorts of interesting stuff to put in your resources section because this uh, is much more complicated uh, than what my slides are able to convey. Uh, one thing about the erythromycins, uh, they can result in nausea and vomiting, diarrhea in certain people, especially erythromycin itself, uh, because they use the cytochrome P450 system for metabolism. There's liver toxicity and drug interactions uh, with uh, other drugs that rely on that system. Uh, by the way, erythromycin is erythromycin, a clarithromycin is biaxin, and azithromycin is zithromaxin. We'll put those trade names on there. There we go. Clarithromycin is biaxin. Uh, it has more effect against mycobacterium uh, and leprosy. I'll let you guys take a look at that. Uh, it's more expensive. Uh, one thing I've noticed about biaxin that we used to talk about is it leaves this metallic taste in their mouth. Uh, however, we do have lesser frequency of this. It's more expensive than uh, erythromycin. Uh, azithromycin that came out as those five-day Z-packs, Zithromax Z-pack. Uh, take two pills the first day and take one a day after that. Uh, not too long after that, they came out with uh, azithromycin uh, orally twice a day for seven days for community-acquired pneumonia. Then they came out with the IV form. Uh, it's also effective against chlamydia, and it's used in combination uh, with uh, third generation cephalosporin for the treatment of gonorrhea as well. Clindamycin is used for severe anaerobic infections and so if you have a tooth abscess uh, maybe your doctor will give you a first generation cephalosporin or maybe they'll give you clindamycin if they're worried about anaerobic infections. Uh, when we did surgery, when we did trauma, uh, we would put them on something called triple antibiotics. You can buy triple antibiotics at the store. Uh, however, uh, in a trauma uh, surgical service, triple antibiotics were an aminoglycoside like genomycin uh, in combination with uh, an, uh, penicillin uh, and clindamycin, ant, gent, and clindamycin. Those were the triple antibiotics that we used. Uh, for a penetrating a wound of the gut, ampicillin, uh, genomycin, and clindamycin. And the use of clindamycin was the uh, potential uh, anaerobic bacteria that would form deep in places that did not get uh, oxygen. Uh, one of the things that clindamycin is notorious for is uh, Superinfection with Clostridium difficile, C. diff, that's what that's caused, and that causes uh, something called pseudomembranous enterocolitis, uh, which is an overgrowth of Clostridium difficile in the gut. Uh, by the way, anything can cause, any antibiotic can cause superinfection with Clostridium difficile, any broad spectrum antibiotic uh, especially. And so we have to be on the lookout for um, changes in the bowels. Uh, that are due to antibiotic use. Uh, 
usually when I see people developing C. diff, uh, their bowels uh, will become runny and it will take on this smell that they've never smelled before and they'll start having discomfort. Uh, early clinically, uh, treatment of C. diff is live yogurt uh, with all those little probiotics in them and Pepto-Bismol. Uh, however, that's not an effective treatment uh, once the Clostridium difficile takes foot and causes pseudomembranous enterocolitis. And so that's something to keep your eye out for, C. diff Clostridium difficile. The aminoglycosides are genomycin, tobramycin, amikacin. Uh, if you look at a triple antibiotic uh, from over the counter, uh, you'll see an aminoglycoside as well. Uh, and again, these are bacterial inhibitors of protein synthesis. Uh, they're used mostly for uh, gram-negative uh, enteric, uh, meaning coming from the gut. Uh, bacteremia, sepsis, that's when we'll see the aminoglycosides used. Um, yeah, neomycin, that's what's in neosporin. It's topically. Uh, it, we can use it topically uh, in combination with the other ingredients um, or we can use it as a or bowel prep for surgery because uh, it's not absorbed and so we give neo, neomycin uh, into, the, into the bowel. Uh, it's not absorbed and so that can uh, sterilize the bowel or, or remove the near entirety of the bacteria if we're going to do a major bowel surgery. This is what I want you to know about genomycin and the aminoglycosides. Uh, they are very toxic to the kidneys, they are very toxic to the ears uh, when we use them systemically. Um, when my triplets were born, they wanted to give them a dose of genomycin and I started getting excited about this stuff. They're like, well, we're giving a single dose and so the risk of renal and ototoxicity is very low, low when we give a lower dose. However, we're going to give the drug continuously then we're going to do something called peak and trough levels. And so the peak and trough levels will tell us how to appropriately dose the aminoglycoside like genomycin. And so a peak means we give the genomycin, we give it time to swirl around, that's usually half an hour, and then we'll draw a level and we'll see how high that is. And then uh, right before we give the next dose is the trough, that's the low level, that's what a trough is, the low point. Uh, we'll draw that right before the next dose and when we compare the two uh, we can calculate what the next dose of genomycin will be. Uh, back in the Stone Age the formula was very simple. Uh, now that formula is very complicated and I think I'd need a spreadsheet or a computer to do that and so I don't include the formula for going from peak and trough to um, genomycin, however, uh, with all that we're doing mathematically with farm tech, uh, maybe we'll bring back uh, the early peak and trough calculations. Again, neomycin is a topical in um, neosporin. All right, the quinolones are DNA gyrase inhibitors. We talked about DNA gyrase. Uh, they regulate DNA reproduction as well. Uh, they're the fluoroquinolones. Uh, ciprofloxacin is the first uh, fluoroquinolone that remained on the market. Uh, Omniflox came first and it was taken off the market uh, for muscle aches. Uh, and all the fluoroquinolones can cause similar muscle aches. But ciprofloxacin was the first fluoroquinolone to remain on the market. Uh, levofloxacin, which is levoquin, uh, is m used more for uh, lung and sinus infections uh, rather than urinary tract infections. Uh, and so even though the fluoroquinolones uh, are in the same class, ciprofloxacin uh, is more geared toward gram-negative organisms like what we would see in a urinary tract infection. Uh, levofloxacin is more geared towards atypical uh, bacteria that we would see, mixed bacteria, mixed infections that we would see in atypical pneumonias and uh, sinusitis. Uh, the fluoroquinolones that I want you to know, um, we want to avoid these in children because it can damage uh, growing cartilage and so we'll not use them in pregnant women and nursing mothers. All right, I read something very interesting about tuberculosis the other day and I thought, oh, well, I'll share this with you guys. Uh, the anti-mycobacterial drugs, mycobacteria are the same bacteria as tuberculosis. Uh, 
Uh, so tuberculosis is a disease caused by a bacterium called Mycobacterium tuberculosis. By the way, this are in the notes of the uh, Antimicrobial 2 lecture uh, at the end. And again, by the end of the semester, I'm always shuffling this end stuff around, so bear with me. All right, tuberculosis is spread from person to person through the air. Uh, TB usually affects the lungs, but it can affect other parts of the body as well. Uh, the brain, the kidneys, the spine, POTS disease. A uh, person with tuberculosis can die if they do not get treatment. One of the first uh, cases of meningitis that I dealt with as an intern in a hospital, not an internist, but my first year out of medical school, I'm an intern, and we have this very complex case of meningitis. And it took a very long time uh, back then to realize that he had uh, tuberculosis meningitis. Uh, and I have a great read on tuberculosis. I'll be sure and put that in your folders. Um, but again, a, a tuberculosis is a problem that's been throughout history. Uh, some of the oldest uh, uh, mummies that we've dug up in Egypt show signs of tuberculosis. So tuberculosis has been affecting uh, mammals and humans uh, as far back as uh, human history. All right, we talked about cancer chemotherapeutic agents working against rapidly growing uh, uh, cells. Uh, the antibiotics that we use have the same feature. They work better against rapidly growing cells. But the mycobacteria and the cause tuberculosis, they're very slow growing. We call that indolent. Uh, they're very slow growing. And indolent cancers, as well as indolent infections, are very difficult to treat. Uh, the mycobacteria also have a uh, relatively impermeable cell wall. And so, again, tuberculosis is very difficult to eradicate. That's why we have all these sophisticated testing, screening programs, um, and uh, very long treatments to uh, treat tuberculosis. Uh, the mycobacteria will reside uh, intracellularly, and so the treatment will go on for months or years. The uh, mycobacteria uh, will form, uh, the body will form this granuloma around it and wall it off in a healthy individual and prevent that tuberculosis from getting out. Uh, but over time, uh, that organism can escape, uh, especially during times of immune compromise. Uh, so people who are immune compromised, like people with HIV and AIDS, uh, are much more likely to get to tuberculosis uh, because that uh, that walling off of the tuberculosis is not effective in them as well. Um, despite all that, treatment must go on for months or even years to actually eradicate the tuberculosis within our patient. Uh, these are drugs commonly used to treat tuberculosis. Uh, isoniazid, a rifampin, uh, pyrazinamide, ethambutol, and uh, streptomycin uh, is also used. Uh, a second line agent to treat tuberculosis. And again, I have a great big read about the treatment of tuberculosis. Very interesting if you guys are interested in that sort of thing. I'll make sure it ends up that these uh, things end up in your resources section. Uh, isoniazid is a first line treatment in the uh, treatment of tr first line treatment for tuberculosis. Uh, what I want you to remember about isoniazid is this right here causes peripheral, peripheral neuropathy, uh, causes, uh, I'm sorry, causes uh, uh, paresthesias and, and changes in their nerves, the changes in how they uh, can sense and how they feel. And so that's what the peripheral neuropathy, it causes, uh, it causes, uh, causes problems with their nerves and can be toxic to the central nervous system. That's what you want to know about isoniazid. Uh, isoniazid, first line agent, can be used alone or in combination. Uh, TB that's resistant to isoniazid and rifampin is considered drug resistant tuberculosis, multi drug resistant tuberculosis. Uh, but what I want you to remember about isoniazid, first line and uh, so first line treatment, but it does cause peripheral neuropathy. Uh, rifampin, and there are uh, a few other anti-tubercular agents ref related to rifampin that cause this problem right here. They can turn secretion orange, tears and urine. So this will be something that you'll want to tell people if they're on rifampin. 
is it can cause their secretions to turn urine or turn uh, orange. Uh, they are inducers of the, cytop the cytochrome P450 system, so there's a lot of drug interactions. Remember, inducers increase uh, the amount of enzyme activity. And so, uh, rifampin is, again, one of our uh, treatments for tuberculosis. And what do they do? They interfere with uh, DNA and RNA synthesis. Right. Athambutol uh, is another anti uh, mycobacterial agent. Uh, what I want you to know about this, it's ethambutol causes uh, optic neuritis retrobulbar. Retro, uh, behind bulbar is the eye. So retrobulbar neuritis is the same thing as optic neuritis. Can cause color, uh, cause color blindness, uh, a loss of visual acuity. This is a favorite board question. Uh, which are the major toxicities of the uh, antimicrobacterial drugs? Uh, pyrazinamide, at the making of this slide, the precise mechanism was unknown, uh, but uh, what I want you to know is pyrazinamide uh, has increased risk of uh, hepatotoxicity and can cause gout. Uh, streptomycin is an aminoglycoside, that's why it's ototoxic and nephrotoxic, um, but it will not work on the intracellular mycobacterium. Hmm, let's see, do I, if I went 8, 30, 10, this is when I confuse myself, am I, am I done now or do I need to go through malaria? Let's go through malaria, uh, although no, I think I'm out of time. Uh, so that being said, we'll come back to malaria, uh, we'll call this lecture uh, uh, done, and uh, when we come back we'll have something interesting to talk about. So until then, aloha.